Now that you're starting to get the handle on how to study from a book, we'll go on to Newton's third law. And again, these objectives kind of give you an idea of what you're supposed to learn. Obviously, if you haven't learned it, then you've got to go back and read it again and work it out again. Staten explains Newton's third law. Identify action-reaction pairs. So he came up with this third law, and it's very far-reaching in its physical significance. For simple introduction, third law, consider the forces involved in a seatbelt. When the brakes are suddenly applied, you are riding in your moving car. You continue to move forward. The frictional force on the seat of your pants is not enough to stop you. In doing so, you exert force on the seat belt and shoulder strap. The belt and strap exert con corresponding reaction forces on you, causing you to slow down with the car. If you haven't buckled up, you may keep on going. Newton's first law until another force, such as applied by the dashboard or windshield, slows you down. That's why you wear your seat belts. We commonly think of forces as occurring singularly. However, Newton recognized that it is impossible to have a single force. He observed that in any application of force, there is always a mutual interaction, and forces occur in pairs. An example given by Newton was the following. If you press on a stone with a finger, then the finger is also pressed on, or receives a force, from the stone. Now the stone doesn't know to press on your finger. It's a reaction to the molecules. The molecules in your hand press on this, and as you press on that, the molecules in this compress. Now obviously if I take a piece of tissue, the molecules on it can't compress, and so they in fact accelerate. But a little bit of force is touching. I can feel it and uh, a little bit of force is pressing back and so we can actually talk about this action-reaction pair and so Newton's third law simply states and it's written here for every force there's an equal and opposite force and you can substitute in the words in parentheses for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction which is how you hear it in the world and here's the equation for force 1 to 2 you've got force 2 to 1 you just reverse the things. Of a force of one object on a second thing, you've got a force of the second thing on the first thing. And that's Newton's third law. And it goes on to explain it in more detail. And so you would write this stuff down. I would write down uh, uh, Newton's uh, action-reaction, Newton's third law. Write those down in your notes. Write this equation down in your notes. Come up here and they give you some examples. Now there's, here's a page that's just chock full of writing. It's just writing. It would be easy to look at this and say, I can't do this. I, can't, I don't understand it. Why even bother? But you can sit there and do it a little bit at a time and try to explain it. They're talking about action-reaction forces do not act on the same object. The second law is considered when forces acting in, on a particular object or system. The opposing forces of the third law act on different objects. Hence, the forces cannot cancel each other out or have a vector sum of zero when we apply the second law to the individual objects. For instance, um, you got a box here. You apply a force to the box. The box applies a force back on you, equal and opposite. Uh, and the way the force applies a, bo um, a force back on you is because of friction. And uh, once you overcome friction, you can actually start to move the box. And so you can apply a greater force. Part of that force is your reactionary force feeling the contact, something we're going to call compression. And if uh, that compression force is great enough, you can accelerate the box. So action-reaction pairs can be a little tricky. So you have to uh, kind of uh, think about it. Uh, for this course, we'll deal with action-reaction pairs where the objects are in equilibrium. Uh, the example over here is the weight pushes in the book. The weight of a block pushes down on the table. The block doesn't crush the table. Therefore, the weight, uh, the compressional force of the table pushes back on the block. This is causing compression. If a box is on a table, it has a weight downwards, mg. If the table does not collapse, then the molecules of this table have to undergo a change, kind of like it's being squeezed, or here, like this. If you were to squeeze down on this, it would be compressed. The molecules would get closer together. When they get closer together, the molecular, the field forces, would tend to push it back. And that would be called compression. 
and that's the reactionary force that pushes back on this. So the weight is the weight pushing on the table, the reaction is the table pushing back on the weight, producing compression force here equal to mg. Equal to mg. If you press a downwards on an object, you can actually add to the weight. The object has some weight, you push down and the y component continues to add to it and this reaction force pushes back up. Now it's going to give it, in the reading, a reaction force, it's going to give it a name. And the name it's going to give it is the normal. There is an upward force N whose magnitude is equal to the block's weight. That was the first situation. The first situation we dealt with, the magnitude the magnitude or the size of that reaction force. We're going to call it N. And actually N is going to stand for the normal force. We're going to give it the normal force. I'm looking to see if it actually calls it normal force in here. Yep, there it is, right there. In the middle of the page, it talks about the normal. And normal means perpendicular. Let me tell you where we get normal from, meaning perpendicular. It says so right there. Uh, when you think of normal, you think of, of average population. Yeah, they're normal. That's an, those kids are kind of normal. Well, if you studied a population, you would create what's called a bell curve. And if you drew a perpendicular line in the center, that perpendicular line would be called the normal. And it's normal stands for perpendicular. And when you studied the population, those people that were within a standard deviation of the normal would be called the normal population. And most of the kids are here. Here's the people that above the normal by a standard deviation and above the normal by a couple of standard deviations. And here's people that are below the normal and below by two standard deviations. Now you'll sometimes hear people say, nobody is exactly normal. And what they're talking about is the very small part of the population falls right in this exact line. They fall within that group. However, the word normal means perpendicular. We've come to think of it as meaning average or regular, those kind of things. But it means perpendicular, the normal. So when I press down on the table with my weight, mg, the normal force is the reaction to the table pressing back, the compression force that I feel here. I can add to it mg, and if I push down on the box at an angle, part of that force is going to add to the downward force. So the normal, the reaction force, will be greater than mg, it's going to be equal to mg plus, and if this is some force being applied at some angle theta, then this component would be F sine theta, all from chapter 1. So the normal force would be mg plus F sine theta. That's the reaction force, the perpendicular force.